Hello and welcome at the GCP Mindset channel. Today we speak about a medical device topic again and there's a new guide about safety and clinical performance published. And therefore I have my expert Gaiano with me. Hello everyone. Yeah. And we speak about the guide of course, but also about general requirements for safety reporting and medical device studies. Guyana, thank you very much for being here to talk with me about the new guide which just has been published and we wanted to speak also a little bit more about safety especially in medical device studies but maybe we can start with yourself, you're an expert in safety um, in medical device studies but also in pharmaceutical studies but let's talk about medical devices. What makes you an expert? What kind of experience do you have? As product safety officers, um, I'm responsible for the reporting and preparation of uh, serious adverse event information for the sponsor. And of course, we um, report them if needed to the national competent authorities and ethics committees. Uh, at the same time, um, we are involved in the processes and we perform um, tasks um, concerning the medical documentation, such as um, development of the safety update report, um, periodic safety update reports, trend reports. Yeah. Okay, great. Sounds interesting. Um, but you used already some terms which probably not everybody knows. Maybe you can summarize which parameters need to be evaluated within clinical trials and what needs to be reported. Within clinical trials uh, where used medical devices, um, all of the adverse events will be collected. Uh, and of course, um, only serious adverse uh, events will be reported to the competent authorities. In this case, um, in relation to the medical devices or medical um, procedures which are used to implement or, um, or usage of medical devices. In such case, um, there is also a lot of variation within the countries. In some countries, uh, also ethic committees would like to receive information on the serious adverse. Uh, um, events uh, in, uh, where the med uh, medical devices were involved, uh, in some cases not. And uh, at the same time, during the post-marketing uh, evaluation, post-marketing studies, uh, competent authorities uh, like to receive their incidents. So incident reporting is needed during the post-marketing yeah. studies. Okay, but generally, uh, because we have a lot of medical device uh, companies who never did a study and have no understanding for clinical trials. And adverse events does not mean that uh, the medical adverse event is related to the device. Anything what is adverse needs to be collected, correct? Uh, all of them are supposed to be collected. Uh, of course, sponsor also can specify what he wants to uh, collect in uh, his protocol. But of course, for pre-marketing, usually uh, sponsors are interested in everything what is uh, happening around their product. Okay, an adverse event is no side effect, but what makes an adverse event serious? The adverse event becomes serious only uh, in following cases, uh, such as if it's led to death, if it's led to serious deterioration in health of the subject, uh, as an example, is there a life-threatening illness or injury, a permanent impairment of the body structure, also the hospitalization itself and a prolongation of uh, hospitalization, medical or surgical intervention to prevent the life-threatening uh, which happened, and the ones which happens are not so often and happily, it's the ones which led to the fetal distress or fetal death. So thank you very much. One point I consider is very important because that's so, so much different to drug studies. Uh, that's uh, I think the fourth point where you say um, also interventions which, which avoid life-threatening events. And um, I think it needs to be judged by the investigator if his or her intervention really avoids such an event. And I think it's not easy to say, um, I really saved the life of the patient. Yeah, uh, I would say it's true. And it is true because investigator uh, supposed to decide by his experience and by his knowledge um, background um, what he's doing and um, um, what is happening with the uh, patient and he knows uh, what's happened before and now happening and um, he needs to just think um, 
what would have happened if he had uh, not uh, prevented or um, have not stopped what uh, started to happen with the uh, patient. And therefore, um, it is a huge responsibility on the investigator. And of course, there are some differences between the investigators. And of course, they can be biased by their background. Uh, but um, this is uh, what is um, the most, I think, um, important for them um, where they make, uh, need to make a real decision. Yeah, therefore also experience and good training is very important for these guys. Yeah, true. Yeah. Okay, let's assume we have where we experience investigator and they do everything well, they report it and then the serious adverse event reports uh, arrive at your desk. How do you forward them to competent authorities, to ethics committees? Do you have, do you have certain timelines for it? Once we receive the SA report on our desk, we check the minimum for validity criteria and then uh, we check um, uh, which type of SA it was. Uh, when it indicates an unlimited uh, risk of death or injury of the patient, then it's supposed to be reported uh, immediately or maximum within the two working days. Uh, when it is another um, reportable event or a new finding to it, then it's supposed to be reported uh, within the maximum of seven working days. Uh, once it is, uh, or we're talking about the post-marketing uh, studies, then um, adverse events, serious adverse events, or they call it also incidents, supposed to be uh, reported uh, within the two working days uh, when it to cause a serious uh, public uh, health threat or the new finding to it, or within the 10 days supposed to be reported the events which uh, cause uh, death or un unanticipated uh, serious deterioration, and uh, within the 30 days um, any other reportable event. And uh, this is the last point, the 30 days um, will uh, change within the uh, MDR uh, because within the MDR they would want to receive uh, such uh, other reportable events within the 15 days. So you will get uh, your timelines um, two times shorter for this. Okay, when you say other reportable events, what kind of events are these? Um, this other reportable events is the uh, serious adverse events which are fall within the criteria of seriousness or which has the seriousness criteria um, just because they are uh, serious uh, adverse events which implement uh, death, serious injury or uh, such as a public health threat, uh, they're supposed to be reported in the faster um, period of time and then other um, uh, such as uh, for example um, hospitalization or um, body impairment supposed to be ascended within the other timeline. So you have a little bit of time to report other um, adverse events, serious okay. adverse events. Yeah, okay, now I understand. Um, so let's come to the new, new published um, guide about safety and clinical performance evaluation. And it's published by the Medical Device Coordination Group. What kind of group is that? Medical Device uh, Coordination Group is the uh, uh, consortium of the expert which is uh, required by MDR and we see it first in MDR. Um, medical uh, Device Coordinating Group is supposed to be developed um, by the experts in their area. In such case, each member state uh, will provide uh, two representatives, one is the main one and one is the deputy uh, and um, they're supposed to provide um, expert or one of uh, who has expertise in, uh, within the medical devices and then uh, one within the IVD, in vitro diagnostics. Uh, in case um, such person can represent uh, both expertises or ha can have both expertises in their medical devices and in vitro diagnostics, then um, member state can um, um, provide or member state can be represented by one main uh, expert and one of course deputy because deputy will uh, help or uh, will reside once the um, main uh, team member is not available. Medical Device uh, Coordination Group uh, represented um, by the team members, as I already said, and um, they shall represent their competent authority within their member states. So the experts are representing the competent authorities, 
but uh, the guide has been written for manufacturers and notified bodies, correct? Yes, that's true. Uh, the guide is written for manufacturers and notified bodies. However, in this case, uh, not for all manufacturers it is applicable, only for manufacturers uh, which has implantable or class 3 medical devices which are not custom made or, or not investigational devices. Okay, and the purpose of such guide is? Um, this guide is written, as we already discussed, by the Medical Device Coordinating Group and written for manufacturers and notified bodies. Uh, this guide helps uh, to understand um, what's supposed to be presented and what's supposed to be written uh, by the manufacturers and notified bodies will approve this information. Uh, once this uh, document, which also called a uh, summary of safety and uh, clinical performance, will be drafted by manufacturers, um, notified body will approve it and make it public. The main intention of this um, final uh, product um, is uh, to make um, notice um, for the patients about the safety of their medical device. And could you also summarize a little bit more in detail the document for us? You know, what are the most important topics? The topics of the guide are intended purpose, indication, uh, also other products that are intended to be used in the combination with the main medical device, uh, possible diagnostic and therapeutic alternatives, uh, standards which are used, uh, common specifications, also summary of the clinical evaluation report, post-marketing, clinical follow-up, um, also any other suggestions um, which can help the end users to understand such as training or profile description and of course uh, the information on residual risks, um, undesirable effects, any warnings or precautions. And I think in one part of the guide they speak also about medical devices without a medical intention. So um, according to my understanding that it was a medical device makes a medical device. It always needs to have a medical intention but still uh, it says um, they have also certain rules for these medical devices without medical intention and for these devices I think the benefit needs to be shown. Can you explain me what kind of medical devices don't need to have a medical intention? Yes, you're right. All of the medical devices are supposed to have the purpose and medical purpose. However, um, the, um, there are some medical devices that can um, be used for some um, other purposes uh, as um, medical, um, as an example, breast implants or the contact lenses, uh, which are used for uh, some uh, uh, perfection of the body, perfection of the face, at the same time is also this aesthetic uh, medical devices which are used um, uh, for the also uh, aesthetically to look better, uh, uh, such ones as the dermafillers. Okay, but for these medical devices also the performance needs to be shown. Yes, Like true. for normal medical devices. Yes, it is true. Uh, nowadays, MDR also mentioned uh, um, that uh, such uh, medical devices without their uh, medical intention also supposed to uh, show their uh, safety and their uh, clinical performance and supposed to comply to their uh, new regulations. Okay, understood. But what will change um, in terms of clinical evaluation according to that guide? Um, as we know that uh, since the MDR was introduced, uh, um, the process of clinical evaluation anyhow will get more complex and uh, this guide um, uh, which came for the safety um, um, somehow a little bit uh, helping um, to um, make it more easy. Uh, however, at the end the process will get uh, more complicated and this is um, the intention of uh, competent authorities uh, uh, to uh, make it more strict um, uh, to get on the market, to, to put your product on the market and at the same time it's for them easier to control what is uh, getting on the market and what is, stay and what is staying on the market. Uh, and um, another idea behind um, this uh, new guide and new regulations is um, uh, to make it more tr uh, transparent for the end users um, and to show what's happening uh, with the safety and um, clinical performance of the medical device. Okay, yeah. And I assume, because that's what you mentioned already, that also the risk evaluation is part of the um, guide actually. That should be explained in detail. 
And there's also a wording which says uh, residual risk. I know what's the risk of a medical device, it's quite mm -hmm. easy, but what is the, this uh, residual risk uh, of a medical device? What, what do the manufacturer need to do to evaluate that? Residual risk is the uh, risk left over after the manufacturer has already took some measures to control his uh, risks uh, of the medical device. For example, what can it be? Do, do you have an example? Um, some of the misuse of the medical device or the de medical device was used uh, not according to the IFU for some uh, other indication or for some uh, other use uh, which uh, device were not tested for. Okay, but it sounds quite complicated to do it uh, because you need to imagine what is the user or how the user might use it. Yeah, you're supposed to uh, kind of pre-think um, what, what can happen if a uh, patient uh, will not, um, maybe the patient also doesn't read uh, um, instructions for use and what he will do when he sees uh, his device, uh, how he will implement it. So you're supposed to think uh, two or three steps beforehand what can happen, what, you know, how the uh, human brain can think. Um, yeah, it is complicated. There are many things very complicated in the medical device world, but do you think that the guide, for example, this guide really um, makes it easier to do a safety evaluation for the medical device manufacturers? This guide, which is written for a summary of safety and clinical performance, uh, I think will help a lot uh, because it uh, precisely describes uh, uh, what's supposed to be written in which form, uh, also which languages can be used, uh, how do you understand which languages, uh, for example, um, um, you're supposed to use only English or maybe your national language or um, uh, some other countries where your uh, device is um, uh, presented on the market. Um, this guide is uh, helping you a lot uh, compared to the MDR because MDR just um, uh, provides you information that you're supposed to provide the guide. And uh, this guide, which is uh, drafted by the Medical Device Coordinating Group, um, opens up for you which topics you're supposed to discuss, uh, uh, how the data is supposed to be presented. And I think it is a huge help uh, for the manufacturers in this case. Okay. And if somebody would ask you now, um, for help, what would be your most important advice for a um, sponsor of a medical device or medical device study, let's say it's in that way? My advice to the sponsors will be not to underestimate the uh, safety topic uh, because as we see uh, in the uh, regulations which is coming, uh, it becomes more stricter and will be more uh, regulated by the national competent authorities. And um, my advice to the sponsors, um, if you don't know how to proceed in your uh, safety assessments, um, please contact the people who has more experience in it, the experts, um, everyone will be happy to help. Um, yeah, so this is the main thing that um, I would have make point on. Okay, very good. Ask an expert is always a good advice. Thank you. And thank you very much for the nice interview. It was very interesting. I also that you liked the interview, please leave um, us your comments, send us your questions, and if you need your help, yeah, just ask an expert. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye.